Um, hi everyone, thanks for taking the time to come to the talk on your over your lunch time. Um, I, I feel like I'm just going to start by um, giving you all a little bit of background about the Roberts Institute of Art because I think some of you might not might not know that much about it. Um, so the Roberts Institute of Art is actually formally known as the David Roberts Art Foundation and I'm not going to talk too much about that because this is quite a short talk but there's lots of information on our website about uh, about DRAF, um, which ran from 20, 2007 to 2017. Um, and now we are the Roberts Institute of Art. Um, and that we, and along with that name change, we have a kind of slightly new direction and a new way of working. So the, the, collect, the, um, the foundation or the institute is, is actually based on, or really was founded by David Roberts and his, based on his collection. So he has a collection which is now called the David and Indra Roberts collection which uh, has two and a half thousand works or almost two and a half thousand works by over 850 artists so it's a significant private collection uh, based in the UK and it dates from the works in the collection date from sort of mid 20th century up, right up until today and it's we still acquire works um, and it's a kind of quite incredible resource really because some of the works in it are just unbelievable and you know many of them not many of them, but many of the works in this exhibition are from the collection. So we use the collection to create exhibitions, collaborative exhibitions um, in institutions across the UK like this one, which has been a, a real sort of joy to work with uh, the Hunterian on this um, and bring these kind of new perspectives to two kind of radically different collections. Um, but we also use the collection to commission texts. So they might be by writers, but they also might be by artists or scientists or poets. Um, and we commission them to write either on our exhibitions or on, um, on works themselves. And so they sometimes will visit the uh, warehouse, for example, to see a work, and then they might write a kind of close study of that work. And some of those are on our website um, that, that is kind of freely available. And we also have a loans program um, both nationally and internationally um, and we're looking to expand that at the moment so the website now has a kind of section on it um, purely for the collection where you can see a selection of works from the collection um, and then finally I suppose it's just an, a kind of incredible resource really to use for research and um, we uh, yeah it's, it forms the basis of a lot of our other programming um, so yeah, just a kind of inspirational tool, I suppose. Um, and then our other, one of our other uh, main areas of focus is performance art. So that's something that's also been carried over from the David Roberts Art Foundation, uh, where we did uh, large scale uh, one night performances called evening of performances, which were normally coincided with freeze week um, in London. Uh, we've moved away from that model now and we are focusing more on kind of working individually with artists on solo presentations which um, are developed over a longer period of time perhaps involving extended research um, but also thinking together with us and the artist and then leaving a good amount of space for experimentation and failure and feeding back and that kind of a process because I think we feel like that's something that is often a bit missing from contemporary perform contemporary art performances anyway and then the um the third part of our program is our residency program which is due to launch this summer which is based in scotland and again it's very artist focused offering time and space to artists um to try something new or learn and have Kind of time away from uh, their day to day um, and there's also there's no requisite for production um, it's really down to the artist what they want to do and we discuss with them how they'd like to spend their time it's not an open call um, it's it, like it's very bespoke I suppose we select the artists and then they're in residence for between four and six weeks in Scotland near in Angus just about two hours from Dundee and then finally, I guess we have an online platform on our website, which houses a lot of things like podcasts and videos, but also texts um, and kind of helps to tie all of these different things together because we don't have our own gallery space. So it's important we have a kind of place in which we can uh, perhaps posit a lot of this, this stuff. OK, so that's the kind of background of the Roberts Institute of Art. And 
I suppose I wanted to start this by just talking a little bit about um, some of the research that was very early on in Dominic and I's conversations. And um, I mean, this image here is a is is uh, a very early sketch of Darwin's Tree of Life. And I'm not going to say too much about that now, but hopefully it will kind of come back at the end when I when I finish. Um, so the first image I'm going to show you, this is a cave painting from the, uh, fr from the Mirar people in the Jabaluka uh, region of Kakadu National Park in the Northern Ter Territories of Australia, which is, happens to be just next to a uranium mine. And um, one of the things that Dominic and I talked about was this kind of uh, episode where just after the Fukushima disaster in Japan in 2010, a woman called Yvonne Margarula, who is uh, the traditional owner of the Mirar people in the Northern Territories of Australia and a fierce environmentalist, um, wrote to Ban Ki-moon to, uh, to um, kind of uh, state, her, state their solidarity with the Japanese people, but also to apologize effectively for the Fukushima disaster because some of the uranium in Fukushima was taken from their land and they claim responsibility for anything that happens in their, in their lands. And there is a, there's a, a story from, from their culture where if any rocks are moved from this part of their land in this uh, Kakadu National Park, a giant serpent will raise up and devour the earth. So there is a kind of long, deep knowledge of uh, the materials from this part of the world um, through the Mirar people and they uh, have warned and and have warned over generations not to disturb this part of the world I um, mean in fact there's a there's a campaign still ongoing at the moment that they want to bring the uranium mine back into the ownership of the Mirar people um, so I guess uh, th this this cave painting is one that is near the near the mine and there are um, theories or suggestions that this is actually a painting of someone who has uh, who's had some sort of radiation poisoning um, due to the uranium that is in the in the land there and you have these kind of strange uh, blobs or, or uh, distended limbs which is kind of um, which is suggestive of radiation poisoning now there's nothing that that that, that exists that can exactly prove that but it is a theory so I think where this why is this related to the body and the kind of the exhibition that we have in 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 flesh arranges itself differently is that this idea of um knowledge being passed from one body to the next and particularly through uh through language and through over over generations so the mirror people traditionally have an oral language so they have words for example for um for snow and ice where there hasn't really been any snow or ice on their lands for i mean something like 20 to 25,000 years so there there is this very very deep knowledge coming through their bodies um and that's i suppose one of the one of the key tenets particularly of the later works in the show um many of the 21st and some of the 20th century work, late 20th century work, sorry, um, kind of have this idea of bodily knowledge and things stretching out through time using the body. So let's get into the work. So the first work I'm going to talk about is Jan Vo, which is this uh, pink uh, Andy Warhol print um, on the wall there. There it's seen in, in um, in the context of the exhibition. So Jan Vo is a Vietnamese artist. This work's called Untitled, uh, which is significant in his practice, um, and it's from 2014. So just to kind of clarify this, his, he, uses the, he uses Untitled for a lot of his shows, for a lot of his works, and storytelling is really at the very heart of Jan's practice. Um, there's a story where, so he was, he was brought up in Denmark, but he was born in Vietnam. Uh, during the end of the Vietnam War with America. Um, and he, was, he became a refugee and moved to, um, they were trying to get to America, him and his family, but they ended up in Denmark. He grew up in Denmark. Um, he could speak Vietnamese, but he couldn't read it. And on, when he was a child, on a trip to Vietnam, they were going through a, a, a graveyard with his mum and 
he uh, he noticed that a lot of the graves had Vo Yarn written on them, and he asked his mum, like, why why is my name but inverted on all of these graves? And Vo Yarn in in Vietnamese actually means unnamed. So obviously there was huge numbers of unnamed. Um, deaths or people who died in Vietnam. And um, so they were represented in these graveyards. So I guess this, you know, this is something where he's in, he's, I suppose, inserting his own history into these bigger global histories. And that's something that is uh, a frequent tenet in all of his works. So this work itself takes an original Andy Warhol work uh, and it, of the electric chair. So this is an actual Andy Warhol print. And then it has this kind of text inscribed over the top of it. And the text is inscribed using a font, which is kind of French Gothic, which um, is very common in, in Vietnam due to the French, uh, the, due to it being a former French colony. So obviously um, Andy Warhol, the kind of king of worshiping 20th century consumer culture, particularly Western consumer culture, and also, I guess, celebrity and death. And all of these things come through in this work. And I think the reason that Jan, one of the reasons Jan Vo is interested in it is because he was, I guess, a quote unquote foreigner in Denmark when he was growing up, and, but was obviously being introduced to huge amounts of American culture. Um, as you know, as happened in Europe, we 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 got lots of American television, lots of American popular culture, and I think all of work, all of Andy Warhol's work, in in one way or another, ends up being about death and celebrity. Now, the text itself, which is very difficult to make out, um, reads, "Born out of a uterus, I had nothing to do with." So within this, he's I think he's bringing us back to his body and his experience of life um, and the toll that the American American imperialism's had it not only through the American War, American Vietnam Vietnamese War, but also through this him having to grow up in a American led culture of Euro, you know European American led culture. So here I guess his body becomes a receptacle of imperialism in a way. Uh, so, next I'm talking about this uh, sculpture, which is um, called Hours Working Title Analog Series Tongue, and it's from 2013, it's by the artist Michael Dean. Um, Michael Dean's work, I guess, begins uh, with his own writing often, um, and he then sort of abstracts these texts into sculptures and immersive installations that explore language, uh, they explore the body, but particularly he's very interested in intimacy. And this series, I think, reflects this kind of, with its very long and awkward title, um, you know, hours, and then in parentheses, working title, comma, analog series, and then in parentheses, tongue. It's quite a kind of, uh, it's a mouthful, I guess, um, no pun intended. But I guess it, I think he's really interested in the kind of um, fallibility of communication or the fallibility of language in particular. And, you know, here he's really combining this by having the kind of very, the physicality of the tongue. And, I'm, and hopefully some of you have been to the show, but the, this sculpture, it really does feel like a tongue. You know, it, it, even though it's solid concrete, it's sort of flopping over this, this plinth. And it looks like if you picked it up, it would kind of sag. Um, with the kind of heaviness of concrete, I guess. It's a very, um, there's a kind of slight dissonance that happens when you're looking at it. And I suppose one of the things that interested Dominic and I about this was, was this engagement with language and the body and how the body is the sort of conduit for language, despite the fact that it's often written down. That's very different to the way language feels and the way language sounds and how the different elements, depending on who's speaking, what language. And, you know, I think one thing that I love about this is it, it very simply reveals this just by, cre you know, by uh, very profoundly presenting the physicality of the tongue, which is something that, despite being a kind of real engine of expression, um, is something that we very rarely see, you know, it's something that we only really feel, whether it's ours or someone else's, you know, we taste with it, we kiss with it and we speak with it. It's this kind of fundamental um, part of our body that is that's very rarely seen but is but is in, in 
is intrinsic to our communication with the outside world, but also I think bringing the world into us, like I said, through, through tasting or even through like kissing your lover or whatever it is. And that's just it in context as well. So you can see it here next to some Michael E. Smith work. This is the uh, Horst Adamite work, which I'm going to be talking about later. And this is the Yayo Kasama, which I'll also talk about. So here we have um, two Loewy Hollowell images, which are the two paintings on the uh, left, no, the right of the image, sorry, the two colorful paintings, which are somewhere between a painting and a sculpture. And I have uh, some closer up images of these, so don't worry, because it's, it's a little bit difficult to see them in that one. So this first one is, but actually, I wonder if I can just zoom in to this a little bit to see if we can, yeah. So there, hopefully you can see that they're actually, three-dimensional so they're not flat painting so she they're a mixture of um kind of uh foam and and paint and pastel and so she creates these kind of shapes that are slightly bulbous so if you're standing directly in front of these paintings they they'll often appear completely flat but as you move slightly you start to see these sort of deceptive um uh bulbous areas of them or, or points of uh, kind of point Point, where points meet. Um, okay, no, I can't go down. There we go. So this first one is called, uh, I've got these the wrong way around. No, I haven't, there we go. So Boob Wheel in Blue and Yellow from 2020. And the second work is called Squeeze Cheeks. Um, and you might have seen, if you go into the show, we, there's a free booklet and this is the cover of it. So you can even take this one home with you. Um, so I think the, 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 I mean, these are really incredibly beautiful works and, and they, uh, they're extremely powerful in terms of making you feel something, I guess, in, in the way that the best abstract paintings do. And she takes the starting point for all of her work actually is her experiences giving birth, um, which is obviously, something that is universal to a point. I mean, you know, everybody has been born um, and but obviously not everybody gives birth. Um, but she's, I think within that, she's obviously able to focus on something which is both deeply personal, but also this thing of everyone can understand that as an experience. And the works um, are kind of representative of her practice in that they offer some sort of vision of a sensation. And going back to this idea that, um, that Michael Dean is interested in where language is kind of fallible or, or, or unable to really communicate what we want it to. I think that's one thing that she's very interested in where words fail and we're left trying to describe something that perhaps no one else will really fully understand because they're all our own discrete experiences of this bodily sensation. I think, you know, bringing this into this show, bringing these works into this show, I think is really, um, challenging a lot of the ideas of the Enlightenment and, and where the Hunterian uh, collection was founded from in terms of medicine has really since its inception or Western medicine since its inception has kind of just tried to describe bodily sensations and to categorize and homogenize things like pain or soreness or stinging or aching and ultimately that they're very different to everyone. And, and, you know, it's very difficult to accurately describe what something feels like. I mean, I have, uh, you know, from my own personal experience, I have, I remember there's, there's a dream that I have every time I have a fever and it's very specific. Like there's no real visuals. It just, it's like, it's just like, the only thing I can describe it is, is like a throbbing. A bit like, but my whole being, the whole being, the whole dream is just a throbbing. There's nothing visual that I could describe. And, you know, things like that, that's a very inadequate way for me to describe, to describe that if I want someone else to actually understand it. So I think, you know, with these works, that's what she's trying to get at. And, and for me personally, I think, you know, particularly with this one, Squeeze Cheeks, I can sort of feel a sensation of squeezing and a point of release with that line and the dot, which I think you know, it's, it's very visceral, which I think is um, one of the incredibly, uh, one of the amazing things about her work really. Um, so then we have Yayu Kasama. And I think one of the interesting things about Kasama, I guess, is that, you know, despite all the kind of, 
marketing hullabaloo that happens with her mirror rooms and um, and various other works that you see at places like Tate. I think you know the the work is really deeply rooted in a kind of psychological trauma that she has from a very young age. I mean, she's uh, she's in her mid mid to late nineties now. She's lived voluntarily in a psych psychiatric hospital for the last forty four years, where she still makes work with her studio. But you know, and I think these um, the dots for her that are a recurring theme in her work, whether that's through the mirror rooms or through these kind of paintings or through her pumpkins, um, are a kind of way for her to externalize a neurosis or an obsessiveness. And I think, you know, these ones, there's a, there's a, with her paintings and her installations in particular, there's, a, there's always a sort of feeling of a kind of inside outness. And, the dots are a little bit similar perhaps to those that you get when you're dizzy. So there's also a kind of illusory um, uh, sort of psychosomatic, psychological um, element to it where you see things that are quote unquote not there, I guess. You know, they, the, when you, if you get up too quickly or whatever and you see dots, the dots are there, but they're not there. They're inside you, they're not they're not out in the world. So, and I think that's one of the things that she's trying to convey with the, the, the use of dots in her work. I think this work in particular is interesting because it has a kind of, it's not just a gray background as you see there, it's kind of silvery. So, which creates a sort of a bit, a slight sort of vertigo in the audience or the viewer when you walk past it, you know, if you're wearing a bright shirt or, or a pair of trousers or whatever, you can kind of see yourself move past it. Or as you walk around the space, different things get reflected in it, which just has this sort of like slightly, um, I suppose, unsettling sensation if you're really fixed on it. And that's just a slightly closer up picture of it. Um, so here we are gonna talk about these Polaroids on the right hand side of the picture. Um, so this is work by Horst Adamite, who, these are basically called, uh, well, these are a very small selection of observation photos that he made between 1992 and 2004. During that period, he made uh, somewhere in the region, probably more than 6,000 of these. Um, and they were images that he took of um, what he described as cold rays. So he believed that um, there was a unnamed organization in the world um, that was out to get him and the rest of the world. And they were doing this through the use of cold rays. He believed that the cold rays were responsible for the lowering of temperature, interfering with brain waves, electrical currents, jamming the signal of his radio. I mean, even turning bottles of sour wine uh, sorry, turning bottles of wine sour. Um, but they also, you know, penetrated him and his body and his flat. And essentially, these were, this was a kind of paranoid construction in, in his mind. I think what's interesting about Horst Adamite is that he, uh, he actually studied art under Joseph Boys in the 1970s. So these representations are whilst they're not necessarily artworks, they are coming from someone who has been trained in art. So he has a, a certain aesthetic, I suppose, a certain sensibility to aesthetics. Now these, these Polaroids are quite varied. This, I've just got a couple of examples of them close up. So here you can see one where he's got these kind of various ammeters and kind of radio uh, measuring devices. And in the papers here, he's got, he's kind of, trying to highlight things where he's suggestive that the that this organization is telling him things through the newspapers which is quite a common kind of um uh, paranoid thought in the uh, for people that, that suffer from this kind of condition in the particularly in the in the 80s and the 90s and then he annotates some of them i mean this this is one of the examples where he's annotated this kind of incredibly uh, detailed and obsessively. I mean, I've never been able to find like um, a kind of transcription of these or, or a translation of what's written here. I, to be honest, I don't know if anyone would be able to um, because the writing is so small. Um, and then there's, there's also other things which are slightly more mundane where he's 
been out and seen things, you know, things like this, street scenes, um, a phone box, uh, like telephone wires, bikes, there's all sorts of types of images. So these really are, I suppose we were interested in the idea that A, that not everything in the show is art because lots of the Hunterian um, works we have are not necessarily art, but representations, but also with this, this work is this kind of idea of exposure, um, but also that his, his experience of the world, reaching out into the world to try to explain these cold rays really was a bodily feeling. He felt like there was these cold rays happening and, and they were penetrating him. Um, so I guess that's all the works I'm gonna show. Um, and the, uh, the last thing I want to do really, I guess, is talk about this idea of um, humans, us reaching outside of our body to understand the world. And I think that's, that's true in a lot of the works I've just, talked about, particularly, I guess, the um, Horst Adamites and the Kasama works, but also Lowy Hollowell to a degree. And I think there's a, so there's a, there's a, a Platonian um, idea that humans are all celestial plants, he, he describes us as, um, which is why I'm going back to now the um, image of Darwin's tree of life which is here. So, I mean, in this kind of beautiful idea of us being celestial plants, he's talking about, basically he describes us as upside down plants with roots that stretch out into the cosmos from our, through our imagination. Um, and in Michael Marder's book, The Philosopher's Plant and Intellectual Herbarium, he describes it as, as heavenly plants hung from the edic edict sphere by invisible roots, Converging on human minds, humans became like puppets that move a sense of purpose when guided by the rational demon, or which is the capacity for reason. So I guess what I'm trying to link up a little bit here, I suppose, in terms of the Yvonne Margarula and this tree of life thing with Darwin is that I think there's a, there's a very important way of thinking about our relationship to the world, which is that we are all part of the world, but it, it it's often presented in this kind of, there's of, often, I guess, a Western view of things and then a sort of Mother Earth narrative view of things. And I think the two things need to come together more. And there's plenty of examples within Western thinking of that. And I think this, this diagram of Tree of Life, of uh, an early diagram of Tree of Life of Darwin is, is an interesting, perhaps, place to start with that. So yeah, if anyone's got any questions, happy to talk a little more. Thanks.